Good evening. I was just saying to our speaker, Adam, we've got a rowdy bunch in the house tonight. <laughs> I'm enjoying the, uh, the buzz. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Turner. For um, those of you who don't know me, I'm the director here at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. It's a real pleasure to welcome so many of you in the room. Um, and I can tell already by this atmosphere, we're all really eager um, to hear um, tonight's presentation uh, by Adam Eker. And we're also delighted to welcome people who are joining us online as well. Adam is Associate Curator of European Paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So we're very uh, delighted to have him with us in London. And as many of you know, he's curated some amazing, very memorable exhibitions um, on Anthony van Dyck, uh, 17th century Dutch painting and art at the Tudor court. It, it was really, that for me was a real exhibition of feeling as well as seeing. Um, his publications include monographs on Van Dyck, which I'm proud the PMC um, has published, and the Dutch artist Gesine Ter Bosch. Um, he's here to present some new work to us, very much kind of hot, well, not even on the press at the moment. It's really from the archives and thinking um, for a forthcoming project, which he's going to present on the body of the Maharani portraiture gender and empire at the Royal Academy, 1791 to 1865. Before I hand over to Adam, Adam and I have both agreed that we'd like to dedicate tonight's research um, seminar to the memory of a friend and colleague, Natasha Eaton. Many of you in the room um, who are interested in the relationships between Britain and India and the networks of empire will know and have been impacted by um, Natasha's brilliant work. It was her funeral today, so many of us in this room, I think, are still feeling the rawness of her passing. But we really want to celebrate her work and the impact it, it really may, has made and will continue to make on British art in these expanded contexts and really thinking very seriously through the histories and networks of empire. So thank you, Adam, for sh you know, allowing me to share that and, and, make, and marking um, this with your, your research seminar. But I know Natasha was a very joyful person. Mm -hmm. She really believed in intellectual inquiry. So she wouldn't want us to be somber. She would want us to get on, do the work, listen carefully with great attention to Adam's research. And so in that spirit, I'm gonna hand over and ask you to give, uh, help me give Adam a very warm welcome to the Paul Mellon Center. Thanks so much, Sarah, for that warm welcome and that beautiful dedication to Natasha's memory. I wanna thank you all for joining tonight uh, in person or online. I also would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that exactly 20 years ago, I was a Yale freshman uh, doing Yale in London here at the Paul Mellon Center. At the time, I thought I was going to be a German lit major. And uh, I think it's safe to say that that summer really changed the course of my life. So it feels like a wonderful intellectual homecoming to be back here this evening. On February 9th, 1863, Two men sought out the painter, George Richmond, to propose an unusual commission. Finding him away from home, one of the men, the Earl of Levin in Melville, followed up with the letter the next day. He wrote, My dear Mr. Richmond, I called upon you yesterday with the Maharaja in hopes you would accede to his wish that you would undertake to paint a picture of the Rani, his mama. She is attained somewhere about the age of 40, which he considers very old. She has been very good looking, Indian beauty soon decays, but being a celebrity, I think perhaps you might like a sitter or squatter out of the usual class. The Maharaja is coming to us on Saturday to stay until Monday, and I wish to persuade you to do the same. The Maharaja in question was Dalip Singh, whom the British had deposed as a child from the throne of the Sikh empire. The Rani was his mother, Jinkor, who had served as regent of the empire on her son's behalf. Vilified by East India Company officials and the British press as a malign influence on her son, Jin Kaur spent the years 1847 to 1861 in exile, 
while Dalip Singh was consigned to the care of British officials and eventually sent to England. The portrait that Queen Victoria commissioned of the young Maharaja from Franz Xavier Winterhalter shortly after his arrival in England in 1854 has become a touchstone within the literature on the dispossession of Indian royalty and the plundering of Indian cultural heritage under British rule. Ramita Ray has aptly characterized the portrait as, quote, a masquerade of loss that hinges upon the multiple corrosions of political and psychic agency that came with the Maharaja's dethronement, specifically his divestment of property and political and symbolic power, unquote. Indeed, Dalip Singh remains best known today for what was taken from him, most infamously the Koh i Noor diamond. The continued presence of the Koh i Noor among the British crown jewels remains a major bone of post colonial contention, with formal claims on the stone lodged by the modern governments of India, Pakistan, and <coughs> Afghanistan. The diamond's absence from the recent coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla bespoke its uncomfortably contested status as an icon of both British royal power and of British colonial theft. Lord Levin and Melville's letter cited above captures a different moment in Dalip Singh's life, nine years after he posed for his portrait by Winterhalter. Having attained legal majority, he made increasingly vociferous efforts to reclaim his patrimony from the British government. The archives of the India office, now at the British Library, are full of Dalip Singh's petitions and the sometimes outraged responses they engendered on the part of British officials. One early success of Dalip Singh's campaign was the permission he received to travel to India, where he reunited with his mother, Jin Kaur, at a Calcutta hotel in 1861, while jubilant crowds gathered outside. Shortly thereafter, the British authorities restituted Jin Kaur's personal jewels to her, and mother and son traveled to England. It was in this context that Dalip Singh, famous as the subject of portraits, decided to commission one himself. Acting as the Maharaja's intermediary with the celebrated society portraitist George Richmond, Lord Levin and Melville adopted a, jo a jocular tone that is deeply revealing about imperial British attitudes toward elite Indian women and their representation. He describes the Maharani as a celebrity and a famous beauty, but one who has decayed, as though she were the embodiment of larger Orientalist tropes about both the allure and the putative decline of Indian civilization. His description of Jin Kaur as, quote, a sitter or squatter out of the usual class, unquote, proposes her as an exotic subject for the portraitist of British bishops and duchesses, while revealing a fixation on Indian modes of bodily comportment expressed in the opposition between sitting and squatting. Dilip Singh and Lord Levin in Melville must have been persuasive, as Richmond's diary records eight sittings with the Rani in May of 1863. By this time, however, Jin Kaur's health was failing, and she died on August 1st of that year. A number of drawings survive from the Maharani's sittings with Richmond, indicating that he originally intended to depict her at full length, reclining against a bolster with one knee raised. The work that Richmond eventually exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1865, however, nearly two years after the Maharani's death, is a bust-length oil sketch. This work, now in the Kapani collection in San Francisco, provides the subject of my current research as well as the primary focus of my remarks this evening. In what follows, I'll first situate the portrait within the longer history of the display of Indian women's images at the Royal Academy before unpacking more of the specific circumstances of the making and exhibition of the Maharani's portrait and the extensive critical response it inspired. By the time Jin Kaur's portrait went on view in 1865, visitors to the Royal Academy had been encountering Indian subjects on its walls for more than 90 years. Indian figures first arrived at the Academy's exhibition within a few years of its founding, through the medium of history painting. These works provide some of the first examples of the reception of Indian portrait traditions within British art. For example, Edward Penny's Lord Clive explaining to the Nabob the situation of the invalids in India, exhibited in 1772, grafted a profile portrait head clearly derived from Mughal painting onto a gesticulating body from European academic tradition. 
For the first quarter of its century, uh, quarter century of its existence, however, the appearance of pictures with Indian subjects at the Royal Academy was intermittent, largely dependent on arrivals of itinerant artists. William Hodges inundated the Academy with in Indian landscapes following his return to London in the mid 1780s, showing seven such pictures in 1786 alone. Indeed, the vast majority of Indian pictures shown at the Academy into the early 19th century were landscapes, mostly by the uncle-nephew duo Thomas and William Daniel. Portraits of individuals were much more rare and their subjects usually identified according to the Academy's conventions with far less specificity than the landscapes. In 1777, the year after his return from India, Tilly Kettle exhibited the portrait, quote, of a Moore's lady, unquote, perhaps the painting of a woman from the court of Faisabad, now at Yale. This painting, however, may never have been intended as a portrait in a strict sense, but rather a genre image of an ideal type informed in both its subject matter and accoutrements by similar imagery pervasive in North Indian court painting. Within this context, Francesco Rinaldi's portrait of a mogul lady exhibited in 1791 is all the more striking. It was the only picture of an Indian figure shown at the Academy that year, and by my count, only the second painting of an Indian woman ever exhibited at the Academy. The Clippings album in the Royal Academy archives reveals that Rinaldi's painting attracted the attention of at least one as yet unidentified critic who devoted several paragraphs to the painting that are worth unpacking at length. As the critic noted, Rinaldi's picture was hung in the ante room amidst a profusion of portraits, history paintings, and landscapes. It is from the latter in particular that the critic said their attention was distracted by this representation of a beautiful woman, although they were quick to qualify this beauty by acknowledging its foreign origins. The critic alighted the admirable mixed tints of the artist's palette and the quote, very different complexion of his Indian subject. Indian beauty here, as in Lord Levin and Melville's letter to George Richmond, serves as both a goad to an artist's skill and to a viewer's eroticized appreciation. From the discussion of the sitter's complexion, the critic swiftly launched into biographical speculation, writing, quote, the rich appearance of ornaments about this lady's person at first sight made it not appear unlikely to us that the lady belonged to her sovereign. But as there are many of our Indian nabobs as rich as the great mogul, the lady, for aught we know, may be in England and the mistress of some such great man as the quondam governor of Bengal, who might wish to have her drawn in all the glitter of Eastern parade." Unquote. In this passage, the critic first identified the sitter as a potential consort to the Mughal emperor at Delhi before in a revealing moment of self-correction acknowledging that many British adventurers, our Indian nabobs, had extracted enough subcontinental wealth to afford the jewels depicted in the painting and by implication to usurp the sexual possession of their wearer. <coughs> the writer went so far as to associate the sitter with the quondam governor of Bengal, in other words, the infamous and recently impeached Warren Hastings, before suggestively speculating that, quote, the lady for aught we know may be in England, as though she herself might at any moment visit the academy rooms and confront the beholders of her portrait. The exhibition of Rinaldi's painting occurred halfway through Hastings' impeachment trial, which lasted from 1787 to 1795. The author's speculative association of the portrait city, sitter with the quondam governor reveals just how central elite Indian women and their jewelry had become to the public imagination thanks to the much publicized and seemingly never ending trial. A centerpiece of the prosecution's case against Hastings was that he had ordered soldiers to enter the Zanana or women's quarters of the royal family of Avad, where they robbed the Bahu Begum, mother of the Nawab, of her personal jewelry. As Richard Brinsley Sheridan thundered on the floor of parliament, quote, to force that residence and violate its purity by sending armed men into it was a species of torture the cruelty of which could not be conceived by those who were unacquainted with the customs and notions of the inhabitants of Hindustan. Sheridan went on to make a comparison between Turkish and Indian practices of veiling and seclusion, often referred to by the Persian word parda. 
According to the MP, quote, the confinement of the Turkish ladies was in a great measure to be ascribed to the jealousy of their husbands. In Hindustan, the ladies were confined because they thought it contrary to decorum that persons of their sex should be seen abroad. They were not the victims of jealousy in the men. On the contrary, their sequestration from the world was voluntary. They were enshrined rather than immured. As many feminist and post-colonial scholars have argued, the practice of parda by both elite Muslim and Hindu women in India was a pervasive trope of British colonial rhetoric. Accounts of authorized visits to the Zanana were a highlight of British women's travel writing, prominently advertised in the work of such memoirists as Fanny Parks and Lena Logan. Indian women's own travel also heightened the firsthand observation of Parda amongst the British public. When, for example, the Dowager Queen of Avad visited England in 1856, newspaper coverage focused on her entourage's efforts to maintain her Parda, reporting on a female-only evening at the theater and even illustrating how servants held up drapery to shield her as she boarded the train at Southampton. Given this ample awareness of and fascination with Parda amongst the British public, the exhibition of elite Indian women's portraits acquired an added charge of wireistic allure. Indeed, the very existence of such portraits raises fraught questions of access, consent, and identity. Much of my research into Rinaldi's painting since its acquisition by the Met last year has revolved around the question of the sitter's identity and whether we should even consider this to be the portrait of an identifiable woman at all. Rinaldi inscribed her portrait, Calcutta, 1787, indicating he painted it the year after his arrival in India. Seeing the painting at the RA four years later, the critic quoted above clearly understood Rinaldi's painting to be the portrait of an identifiable woman either a member of the imperial harem or the BB, meaning concubine, of a British nabob. This assumption has held true throughout the small literature on the work. Indeed, a second version of the painting served as the cover to Durba Ghosh's foundational account of relationships between Indian women and European men in early colonial India. My own research has likewise centered on elite Muslim noble women known to be in partnerships with European men in Calcutta or Lucknow during this period. Certain elements of her attire do firmly identify the sitter as an elite Muslim woman, and further research may associate her jewelry more specifically with the sub mughal courts of Lucknow, Murshidabad, or Hyderabad. Intriguingly, as noted above, Rinaldi made a second version of the portrait in which the woman wears identical jewelry, but has slightly different facial features and displays props such as a hookah, an atardan, or perfume holder. Technical examination of the Met picture has indicated extensive compositional changes to the arrangement of the bolsters. This and the fact that the critic in 1791 made no mention of the hookah indicate that the Met picture was likely the primary version dispatched by Rinaldi for display in London while he remained in India himself. Rinaldi appears to have kept the second version with the hookah during his own residence in Lucknow. Sometime in the 1790s, his painting was copied by an artist in Lucknow who assimilated the portrait to local conventions of miniature painting. In this work, the jewelry and props have been altered or given greater specificity and the backdrop embellished with curtains and a hanging lamp. All three paintings illuminate the complex interactions between European and Indian artists in this period particularly when it came to two very different traditions for portraying women. In its current home, the Lucknavi miniature has been cataloged as the stock image of a courtesan. Whether this is indicative of Rinaldi's original intent, or rather the sundering of the sitter's identity from her image through the process of translation remains an open question. North Indian court painters had long portrayed women, both as generic figures in scenes of royal leisure and as named individuals appearing within historical chronicles. But even where the identification of a portrait with a given royal woman appears secure, most such representations are highly codified according to the conventions for depicting queens or nayakas, amorous heroines within Indian tradition. Such likenesses contrast with the individualized and physiognomic conventions of male Mughal portraiture and to a lesser extent, royal Rajput imagery. A telling instance of this gender divide appears in a painting attributed to Bishandas 
of the powerful Mughal queen Noor Jahan holding a portrait of her husband Jahangir. Noor Jahan's representation has a sensuous specificity of detail, from the corkscrew tendril of hair spilling down her temple to the fragrant sandalwood paste that stains her armpits. Her actual face, though, is that of an ageless beauty with conventionally oversized eyes, conjoined brows, and aquiline nose. Her consort, although in fact only eight years her senior, has grizzled whiskers and sideburns, heavy pouches below his eyes, and a softening chin. Whereas his, his portrayal is ultimately based on a prototype made from life, it is unlikely that any male artist would have been granted a portrait sitting with Noor Jahan, who is instead represented through the lens of convention. The device of a picture within a picture neatly insulates these two modes of portrayal from one another. As a cultural institution, Parda became an important marker of status in Northern India, particularly under the reign of Emperor Akbar in the second half of the 16th century. Contact and intermarriage between the Mughal and Rajput courts intensified pre-existing practices of royal female seclusion in Rajasthan with bards and historians venerating legendary Rajput queens such as Padmavati for their strict adherence to Parda, even at the cost of their own lives. In the Deccan, meanwhile, the strategic self-display of another queen, Chanbibi, in order to rally the troops defending Ahmednagar, became its own exemplar of virtuous self-sacrifice enshrined in numerous posthumous portraits. The Sikh Darbar, or, Lahore, or court in Lahore, adopted similar rhetoric to describe the most elite women in the Zanana as parda nashin, even if adherence to actual practices of veiling and seclusion may have been less stringent than at the Rajput or Mughal courts. From within parda, elite Indian women commissioned and collected portraits as objects of veneration, markers of status, and courtly gifts, and trained as painters in their own right. In the mid 17th century, Jahanara Begum, daughter of the Emperor Shah Jahan, commissioned portraits of her Sufi teacher since decorum prevented her from meeting him face to face. Royal Rajput women collected portraits of kings and participated in a, in a system of diplomatic portrait circulation, although they were unable to circulate their own images. Sikh artists likewise navigated the representational constraints of Parda through the depiction of royal women as ideal types. A striking example in the British Museum depicts the wives of Sikh Maharaja Ranjit Singh, father of Dulip Singh, preparing to immolate themselves on his funeral pyre. Of all the figures in the painting, only Ranjit Singh can be described as a physiognomic portrait based, however remotely, on life study. Artistic conventions around Parda persisted well into the colonial period to reinforce hierarchies amongst court women. For example, only lower status consorts appear with physiognomic portraits based on photographs within the Ishknama, the richly illustrated memoirs of the last king of Avad dating to the end of the 1840s. Against this background, elite Indian women's emergence as a subject within European portraiture intensifies the already complex questions of agency and consent inherent to any discussion of portraiture within a colonial context. The sitter of Rinaldi's portrait may be an elite woman who had left Parda, or at least mitigated her practice of it as part of her relationship with a European man. She may also be a Tavayev or female performer who would not have been subject to Parda, but instead professionally visible to a male audience. And indeed, representations of performers and courtesans had a long history in Indian court painting. Finally, Rinaldi Sitter could very possibly be a hired model who lived outside of Parda, but here adopts the guise of an elite woman in order to provide a European audience with a fictive glimpse into the Zenana. In contrast with the unresolved questions raised by Rinaldi's portrait, we can give much more historical specificity to the themes of identity and agency implicit in George Richmond's depiction of Jin Kaur, the image with which I began my lecture and to which I'll now finally return for the remainder of my remarks. Like Rinaldi's painting, Richmond's portrait ignited a, crit a critical response that reveals the persistence of the British colonial fascination with elite Indian women, their jewelry, and their seclusion from public view. In this particular case, the extensive response to the portrait also had much to do with the notoriety of its recently deceased sitter 
and with the extensive upheavals in Anglo-Indian politics in which she had been a major protagonist. The daughter of Ranjit Singh's kennel keeper, Jin Kaur, chose not to commit sati following her much older husband's death, unlike the idealized royal wives depicted in the painting of his funeral pyre. Instead, she survived to eventually serve as regent for her son, Dilip Singh, following his accession to the throne in 1843 at the age of five. Modeling his household on the Mughal Zanana, Ranjit Singh had entered into many marriages, ranging from diplomatic alliances with princely Rajput dynasties to love marriages with Muslim dancers. Jinkor, the youngest and most junior of all Ranjit Singh's wives, was able to claim power following the internecine conflict amongst Ranjit Singh's descendants that eliminated most of her rivals. A deeply controversial figure within Punjabi historiography, she has been alternatively vilified as a scheming and oversexed upstart who doomed an empire or a valiant queen who resisted colonialist incursion. As regent, Jin Kaur astutely played with conventions around Parda and female modesty to assert her power. At court, she largely appeared behind a curtain, but she sometimes emerged from it like the legendary queens of Indian tradition to display herself for carefully calculated effect. Numerous portraits of her, usually in the company of Dilip Singh, survive, although the extent to which these derive from a prototype made from a life is unclear. For contemporary British observers, Jin Kaur's manipulation of Parda contributed to her mystique as a seductive mastermind and the true power behind the throne. As recalled by Major George Broadfoot, quote, the Rani had more spirit than most of the chiefs. On one occasion when the Darbar was terrified by a crowd of drunken and disorderly soldiers, she came out from behind her curtain, threw aside her veil and addressed the people. The men were delighted for she was young and handsome." Unquote. However, other British intelligence reports claim that Jin Kaur's intermittent practice of Parda was turned against her by the fractious army on which her power depended. One agent claimed that the soldiers made a condition of their support that she, quote, move into their camp and let them see her unveiled whenever they thought proper, unquote. Dalip Singh had inherited an empire threatened by infighting amongst various clans, an assertive army that demanded high wages and ever present encroachment by the British East India Company. The various battles, machinations and betrayals leading up to Dalip Singh's eventual deposition from the throne in 1849 are too complex to summarize here, although I highly recommend Priya Atwal's recent revisionist history for those eager to learn more. However, it is worth pointing out that Henry Lawrence, the British resident imposed on the Sikh empire after the first Anglo-Sikh war, chastised Jin Kaur for what he perceived as her violations of Parda during her regency. In response, Jin Kaur wrote, quote, Referring to the part of your memorandum wherein you express your anxious regard for the on honor of Maharaja Ranjit Singh's family, the good government of the kingdom, and the shielding of my honor and reputation, I am much obliged to the British government for taking such care of my fair fame. But you institute a comparison between me and the princesses of Jodhpur, Jaipur, and Nepal. It is easy for them to keep themselves aloof behind their pardas, since there are in those states wise and faithful ministers who watch over the interests of those to whom they owe allegiance. Here, you need not be told what sort of ministers they are. In the face of such defiance, British officials embarked upon a policy of separating mother and son, imprisoning Jin Kaur in the fort at Sheikhupura. The British used the subsequent unrest as the pretext for the full annexation of the Punjab in 1849. Dalip Singh was consigned to the care of British guardians and tutors, converted to Christianity, and eventually arrived in England in 1854, where Queen Victoria commissioned his portrait from Winterhalter. For her part, Jin Kaur managed to escape her imprisonment, taking up residence at the court in Nepal, where she continued to agitate for her son's cause. Only following reports that the Maharani had lost her health and her vision, reducing her power as a political threat, did British authorities allow her to reunite with her son in 1861, following 13 years of forced separation. The portrait of his mother that Dalip Singh commissioned from George Richmond commemorates this reunion and the larger shift in Dalip Singh's agency from being a childhood pawn of imperial politics 
to a grown man with the ability to insert himself on both a cultural and a political stage. The likeness records Jin Kaur's image and more specifically the restoration of her personal jewels following Dalip Singh's extensive campaigning. This restitution itself reflected the massive shift in British imperial policy following the uprising of 1857, the dissolution of the East India Company, and the imposition of direct rule by the crown. Unlike the Sikh crown jewels, most famously the Koh i Noor, which have never been restituted to this day, Jin Kaur's personal jewels were eventually deemed to be her private property. As Lord Canning, the Governor General of India, noted in a letter one year before the jewels restitution, an attempt to sell Jin Kaur's jewels, quote, would probably have passed without observation before the uprising, but now it is different. It is sure to attract notice and to be criticized, and it has become more difficult to defend, unquote. Rather than an act of atonement or concession of wrongdoing, the restitution was an effort to avoid bad press. And that may be familiar to some in the audience today with current developments. On April 26, 1861, an edicon to the governor general drew up an inventory of some 525 items of jewelry that were to be rest restituted to Jin Kaur. Certain items in the inventory can be plausibly associated with the jewels worn by Jin Kaur in her portrait by Richmond. For example, item two, a necklace, quote, consisting of 34 large pearls, eight large emeralds, a pendant with jewels complete, and a ruby drop, unquote. In its terseness and discretion, the inventory brackets an entire history of imperial conquest and dispossession. By contrast, Richmond's portrait, particularly as displayed at the Royal Academy, trumpeted both the restitution of the jewels and the reunion of mother and son. Even in this oil sketch, the jewels are described with enough precision that we can identify the stones and potentially link them to items in the inventory. They also provide an object for the display of Richmond's bravura brushwork laid out in thick impasto over still visible underdrawing. When the painting was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1865, two years after Jen Kaur's death, it was cataloged as, quote, a study from life for a larger picture, unquote identifying it as a sketch for the apparently never realized full-length depiction of the Maharani. One critic writing for The Standard who saw the portrait at the Royal Academy that year racialized both the jewels and the looseness of Richmond's brushwork, describing Jin Kaur as, quote, resplendent in all the pearls and jewels of Oriental wealth and piercing with the quickness of Eastern thought, unquote. In a curious act of projection, this writer transmuted the visible quickness of the British painter's brushwork into a manifestation of his Indian sitter's ostensibly volatile interiority. Another reviewer writing for the Times found in the Maharani's portrait an exception within Richmond's larger body of work. Quote, Mr. Richmond's portraits always bespeak refinement. Indeed, his great fault is a tendency to over-refine by far his most striking work this year is the head, called a sketch, and evidently a rapid work from nature, of the late Maharani Chen Kaur, the wife of the Lion of Lahore, who rose from a dancing girl to queen and showed a brain and a heart equal to her highest fortunes. Mr. Richmond, having evidently had to work against time on this picture, has been put on his metal, and the result is what seems to us the most powerful piece of painting by many degrees that he has ever produced. Who without the catalog would discover Mr. Richmond's timid and rather faltering hand at oil in the largely and effectively indicated mass of gems and jewelry which blazes on the bosom of the Maharani? In this account, the biography of his sitter and the speed at which he was required to work forced Richmond out of his comfort zone and onto a higher plane of achievement. Again, the mass of gems and jewelry provides the focal point for the critic's account of the transformative impact of Indian women as a subject matter for British painters. Indian jewelry, coveted, stolen, and scorned by turn, presented a quandary to British imperialists who sought to present their project as one of moral reform imposed upon decadent potentates. As Siddhartha Shah has argued, to a British audience, jewels marked royal Indian bodies as excessive, picturesque, or effeminate, but they also aroused intense desires for possession and emulation, not least in Queen Victoria herself. On the occasion of the Great Exhibition in 1851, 
Victoria received jewels, including an emerald girdle, plundered from the Sikh royal treasury at Lahore as a personal gift from the directors of the East India Company. By the time Richmond exhibited his portrait of Jankor in 1865, a further controversy had clouded Dalip Singh's reputation. As noted above, the Maharani died on August 1st, 1863. Because cremation was illegal in Great Britain at this time, Dalip Singh, who had earlier converted to Christianity, temporarily deposited his mother's body in a funerary chapel at Kensal Green Cemetery. Within days, two of the Maharani's servants, Uchil Singh and Kishan Singh, fearing that the Maharaja intended to give his mother a Christian burial, placed formal letters of protest in newspapers across the country. Under the heading, The Body of the Maharani, they decried, quote, the intended desecration, framing their argument as one of religious liberty. Their protest was reprinted as far away as San Francisco and found general approval in the press who sought to project enlightened forbearance as a feature of British imperial rule. In a representative editorial, the writer for the Daily Telegraph concluded, quote, we trust that public opinion will speak out against this act, the act of filial violence, which his Royal Highness meditates, and that he will not be allowed to enforce it. Whatever her crimes, and they were neither light nor few, the dignity of death entitles her memory to our respect. For even the executioner of Jezebel had grace and pity enough to remember that she was a king's daughter." Unquote. In the face of a rapidly growing controversy, an associate of Dalip Singh, Lieutenant Colonel J. Oliphant, was forced to respond with his own public letter, clarifying that the cadaver had only been deposited in the vault temporarily, and that Dalip Singh had no intentions of insisting on a Christian burial for his mother. By January, newspapers reported with approbation that Dalip Singh had received permission to transport his mother's body to India, where she was duly cremated according to Sikh rites. <coughs> Against the backdrop of this controversy, George Richmond's decision to exhibit his oil sketch of Jankor in the spring of 1865, just one year after her delayed cremation, may have placed Dalip Singh in a potentially embarrassing predicament. Although my re research is still ongoing, it appears that Richmond's finished full-length portrait of the Maharani, as first commissioned by Dalip Singh in early 1863, was never completed. Either the Maharani or Dalip Singh himself may have terminated the project, given Jin Kaur's failing health that summer. It appears that Richmond kept the oil sketch in his studio before deciding to exhibit it, perhaps keen to capitalize on the late Maharani's notoriety and accurately sensing that it represented an outstanding work in terms of both sitter and facture that would reap the critic's approval. It was only following the exhibition that Dalip Singh acquired the painting from Richmond for 105 pounds. This belated acquisition restored Jin Kaur's portrait to the privacy of her son's home. It remained in the possession of his descendants until it was sold at Christie's in 1990. In the spring of 1865, George Richmond's portrait of Jin Kaur took its place among a number of works that spoke to the evolving image of India as displayed on the walls of the Royal Academy during the first century of its existence. This time period overlapped closely with the consolidation of British colonial rule on the Indian subcontinent. As it had since the 1770s, history painting played a major role in presenting British colonizers as benevolent paternalists. Works on display included two studies for large history paintings by George Jones, depicting the aftermath of the 1857 uprising with British officers functioning as the saviors of brutalized white women and children. A different vision of India surfaced in the Calcutta-born painter, Valentine Princeps, the Lady of the Tutiname, or the Legend of the Parrot, also exhibited at the Royal Academy that year, which placed a notably European-looking woman within a minutely detailed orientalizing interior. The Tutiname is a 14th century Persian language anthology of Indian stories reworked from the original Sanskrit. The premise of the text is that the tales are told to a merchant's wife by her pet parrot as a means of distracting her from taking a lover while her husband is away. The Tutiname is perhaps now most famous for providing the subject matter of some of the earliest Mughal manuscript paintings made in the atelier of Emperor Akbar in the 1580s. As a fusion of Indic and Persian traditions, 
both the original text and its artistic interpretations embody the syncretizing achievements of North Indian court culture. By the mid 19th century, leaves from Akbar's Tutiname were circulating on the European art market where they may have caught the eye of Princep, who knew how to capitalize on his Anglo-Indian identity in the competitive environment of the mid-Victorian exhibition, even if his painting appears more grounded in the material culture of the Ottoman lands than India. At first glance, Richmond's portrait and Princep's erotic genre scene present entirely divergent images of Indian women. One is an Orientalist fantasy of precisely the kind that has provided so much fodder for feminist and post-colonial critique. The other is the commissioned portrait of a named woman whose own letters demonstrate her savvy navigation of the politics of Parda. In their different ways, however, both Richmond's portrait and Princep's genre scene tantalize visitors to the Royal Academy by lifting the veil of Parda, making public that which ought to remain private. The long history of the Tutiname and of Indian courtly depictions of women more generally reveals that this voyeuristic impulse had deep roots in India itself and was not confined to the colonialist gaze. Yet taken out of the context of Mughal palaces and the intimate modes of engagement necessitated by manuscript painting, these works magnified the transgressive exposure already staged in Indian court art. Dalip Singh's commission of his mother's portrait represented an effort to reclaim agency by memorializing a reunion and a restitution that had both initially been opposed by British authorities. Yet the commission's ultimate failure, the scandal surrounding the Maharani's funeral rites, and Richmond's decision to exhibit the preparatory work all meant that in the end, even when it came to his mother's portrait, Dalip Singh was unable to shape his own story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Really fascinating, multi-layered um, presentation. Um, and I um, can feel people gathering their questions and thoughts um, in the room. But I just thought I'd start off and take chairs prerogative with a, with a question for you to just ask you where this research has come from in your own work as a curator and research, kind of what's the driver, is there a particular starting point and, and what you're shaping it into? Because I think it's always interesting for us to see the trajectory of research. Well, I was joking with an old friend yesterday that every time I have a new project, I get really excited because I think I'm embarking in a different direction. And then I realize that I'm reworking exactly the same issues that I've always been gripped by. In this case, is portraiture it's sexuality, it's power relations in the studio, it's consent, gender, all of my preoccupations that, I, that I've always had in, in my work. Um, but the new orientation um, toward this Anglo-Indian material has really grown out of my work as, as a curator at the Met, where I am responsible, among other things, for British painting up to 1800. And when I took on that remit, I realized we really didn't have works that told the story of British India, at least in a direct and accessible way. And so uh, we've been able to make two acquisitions, both portraits of Indian women from the late 18th century. Um, one is the portrait of an Aya, a nursemaid, a Joanna da Silva, and that was the subject of a long research project, also supported by the PMC. And then um, last year, we were able to acquire the Rinaldi. And the current idea is that these will be the focus of an exhibition uh, for 2029. So don't book your tickets to New York yet. Um, I'm, I'm, Start saving yeah. your pennies. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to, to share that that is a collaboration with Tate Britain and my co-curator, um, Alice Inslee, is in the room. And we're also working with uh, Romita Ray, who's, who's a very insightful words about um, Dalip Singh's portrait I, I quote at the beginning of the talk. So this is a larger exhibition project thinking about the depiction of Indian sitters and the transformation of, of portrait traditions within Indi India by both uh, European and Indian artists roughly in, in the period covered by the talk. Fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna open it up to the floor for questions and comments because I can already see hands going up. So yes, we've got a question here. Um, 
Hi, I'm Polly Putnam. I'm a curator at Historic Royal Palaces, and I've been researching this portrait. And the context of the sort of the making of the portrait, just from memory, is um, literally the jewels are arriving, and there's sort of Lady, Lady Logan's recollections. Yeah. And so the question I have is, how much of the jewelry on her is just her like shoving on as much as she can to show that it, she's got it, all her jewels back? Or how much of that was kind of typical of 1840s Maharani style? So if you want a better expression. Yeah. So um, there is this passage in, in Lady Logan's memoirs, Lady Logan being the wife of uh, the Scottish doctor who really became the, the guardian of Dalip Singh. And she talks about her first encounter with Jin Kaur, who has just ha had her jewelry retrieved from the customs house. And Lady Logan, is she's a Scottish Presbyterian. She's very uncomfortable with jewelry. She's very uncomfortable with the fact that Queen Victoria gives another one of her Indian godchildren a gift of jewels for her confirmation. She said it would have been much better to give her a prayer book. And we shouldn't be encouraging this. And so she makes these very snide and condescending remarks about how Jin Kaur has decked herself out in, in all of these jewels. Um, I am not a specialist in Indian jewelry and I've been consulting uh, with some people who are to understand the jewelry really in both of these portraits. Um, my sense is that this is uh, really, a, I would say an authentic representation of how uh, Maharani would adorn herself. Um, so I think that we really have to take Lady Logan's attitude with a grain of salt. But I um, want to give the caveat that I need to do more consultation with experts. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question here. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I wondered if you just had more to say about the, the pose of the um, in the two portraits, because um, I. I find it really, I mean, on the one hand, um, I sort of, I find the Rinaldi really striking for the kind of solidity of that sitting um, pose and the way the pillows kind of prop up the body in a certain way, that it's so frontal. Um, whereas the Richmond, I mean, we don't have, right, the sense of how this reclining portrait would have worked, but there's something so interestingly unstable about the Maharani's body is, is sort of um, how she holds herself up, how the sort of act of presentation or of, of showing herself looking. Um, and whether you there was something interesting to you or, or what you what you were thinking even about just the fact of this sort of reclining portrait, um, which feels a bit um, uh, unique, I guess. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll start with the Rinaldi. So in that passage of criticism that I quoted, the final paragraph, after praising the portrait, he criticizes the fact that she's, quote, posed like a, a, a tailor on his board. Um, he's very uncomfortable with this uh, cross-legged um, seated position and um, says, you know, Rinaldi didn't paint the ankles right. Um, so you see already there this fixation on on Indian modes of, of bodily comportment, again, in, in Lord Levin and Melville's, you know, little nasty joke about a sitter or a squatter. Uh, comes up again. And um, I haven't fully developed this line of thought because I still need to really understand like what happened to this idea for a full length picture. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the, the many compositional sketches that survive, she's posed almost like an odalisque. I mean, it really is uh, a very striking um, bodily position that you just have the, the ghost of in this um, oil sketch. And this is highly speculative, but I've, I've wondered if it wasn't Dalip Singh who sort of vetoed that depiction that George Richmond is, is trying to make, you know, venture into Orientalist genre scene territory. And that's absolutely not what Dalip Singh wants from, from the picture. I don't have any evidence to support that idea, um, but, it, but it's an embryonic notion that I have. Thank you. I just wanted to say as well for the people who are listening to us online, you're also very welcome to ask questions and they'll be sent through to me and I can also put them to Adam. I know it's a brave new world, isn't it? <laughs> We're very connected. Um, I, I, there's another question. Oh, yeah, I just wanted please. to, well, it's just because it's very much related. Just 
the the drawings because I recall in the recent exhibition at the Wallace Collection yeah. about Duleep, I mean about Ranjit Singh rather, with a bit about Duleep Singh, there was a drawing by Richmond for this portrait. So, um, which is obviously of her. I mean, clearly the facial features, but but then those other drawings, as you say, in a kind of Odalis pose, are presumably a model. And so, in a sense, he presumably, Richmond did those off his own bat, perhaps, you know, when they weren't around. And I wondered if you might speculate on the kind of stages. I mean... Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting idea. Um, so, we know from his diary he had um, eight sittings. I want to thank Mark Pomeroy, who's here in the audience, archivist of the Royal Academy Extraordinaire, who's been um, extremely helpful to this project. Um, so, we know he had eight sittings. I had assumed that all of the drawings were made from life, both, okay. both the very finished drawing that was in the Ranjit Singh show at the Wallace Collection of, of her face and then these poses. And actually Lady Logan, again, she she talks about how she sits and how her servants have to carry her. And so it doesn't seem impossible that she might have sat okay. like that. Um, but I'm still really trying to untangle the provenance of, of all of these different works. And there is... Um, a reference, I haven't been able to track it down totally, but a journalist visited Dalip Singh's son at his country house in the late 1890s. And he mentions the finished portrait and a sketch of the Maharani hanging on the wall. So it's possible there is a finished portrait that is untraced and this is the sketch, but I also think there may have been a sketch as in a drawing and then he's perceiving this, which is framed and is an oil painting as a finished portrait. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot left for me to untangle ab about all these preparatory works, where they come from, how they were circulating. Thank you. I've, I've got a question for you from an online uh, member of the yeah. audience and quite a few uh, comments saying thank you so much for a fascinating uh, paper. Um, this question is about uh, Julep Singh. So it's very interesting that Julep Singh commissions this portrait of his mother with all the return jewels given the significance of the Koh noor being brought in to him during his own portrait sittings for Winterholler, which Lady Logan records so memorably. Have you any thoughts on the possible significance of this? That's from Tracy Anderson. Yeah, it is so interesting to me that um, he, he seems to be learning about um, the power of commissioning a portrait of somebody else from Queen Victoria, who that's what the first thing she does when she meets him, she says, he's so beautiful. She's enraptured by him. She wants his portrait painted. And she makes sure that he's depicted wearing her uh, miniature portrait. And that's very common in, in his childhood portraits as well. Um, so she literally is imposed on his body almost as a kind of surrogate, I think, for, mm. for what's been taken from him. Um, and so I think he, he's an extremely savvy navigator of a portrait economy, both a uh, British and, and an Indian portrait economy, I would say. Um, and he he's, does lots of very interesting things that I didn't have space to talk about in here. For example, there's um, a group of portraits of uh, Indian royals, including um, some of his relatives by a Hungarian artist, August Schuft, that are put on touring exhibition around Europe um, in the, I want to say the 1840s. But after his death, Dilip Singh acquires this collection of portraits for himself as a kind of substitute ancestral portrait gallery, um, puts them at his country home. So it's not just this one portrait, but he's, a, he's also a collector. He's commissioning other portraits. And this is something that um, preoccupies him for the rest of his life. Just thinking about that point about the Royal Academy, and when you were speaking, I couldn't think about the actual physic physicality of display, mm -hmm. and then an encounter between viewers and the the dense hang. Yeah. Um, so, do you know much more about where this was hung in the in the Academy? What what was it next to? You know, what was that kind of dynamics of display? Which, yeah. I mean, those exhibition histories of um, I know fueled a lot of people's work in, in, in this room. But just thinking about this, when we stop thinking about a singular work of art, and to just yeah. use that phrase that you 
said to put it back into its either portrait economy or just that that, that larger circulation and display of images um, in the 18th and 19th century that this is kind of made it's made for that context to be seen in yeah um it's a it's a great question and i you know, I was hoping that it was like right next to the George Jones images of, of the uprising, the so-called mutiny in 1857, or right next to the um, the Princep of the Tutiname. It's, it was in a room where I, I think it was the only clearly Indian picture, at least that I can tell from from reading the catalog, but I'd, I'd have to go back to confirm that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the paper. I had a question, just also putting this in relation to uh, things like the, the Hodgkin display, um, uh, where at the Met they're showing his work alongside what he mm. was collecting, and whether you were building some speculative thoughts about what the painters who have been painting these Indian subjects were looking at uh, when yeah. they were painting. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And, and one of my real investments with this larger project is to think about Indian portraiture tradition as as an inspiration for European artists. Um, and I want to, you know, one of the first things I want to establish is like, how did Valentine Princep know about the Tutiname? You know, which leaves did he see? The one that I showed was on the European art market, I think by the 1830s. Um, but I haven't established a, a direct link, but it's clear that he was engaging somehow with this tradition. Um, Edward Penny is looking at, at Mughal portraiture. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have a number of those examples within the exhibition. And it does seem to me that there is a refrain within the criticism that English painters paint better when they are given the so-called challenge of depicting these Indian women that, and you know, in the words of the critic writing about Richmond, that he was put on his medal because it's not just yet another duchess or bishop, which he, I mean, he has about 10 of those in this same exhibition. Um, which everyone talks about how boring they are. Um, so there is this idea that it is, a, it's like, a, it's a stimulant. And I think that is, you can read that against the grain almost as a way to decenter this narrative about the transformation of Indian painting through colonialism, because it's British painting that is transformed just as much. Mm. And that's, that's a theme I hope to develop further. So thank you. I don't guess that, and that gives sort of fuel to the fire of, th of thinking you know, across you know, across continents, across these image economies as well. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of different perspective that that raises. Um, I've got a question here, Gillian. Right. Oh, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see the show. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Do you have um, oh, just a couple of things reg regarding it, the, the, the sketch being um, shown in a smaller room. I mean, was that sort of watercolour room? Was it sort of designated as, you know, sketch drawing rather than, or was it just about marginalising this particular? I, I see Mark. Sitter. Mark is going to come to my rescue. Yeah. <laughs> you can do your yeah. own research at royalacademy.com. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, there is a wonderful website. Also. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't tonight. think it was, you know, there, there was, as you know, so often a gallery, a room of, of drawings, of sketches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was there as a, as a framed oil sketch. I think it, it was shown as an oil painting, oil even painting, if, yeah. even if cataloged right. Right. Um, as, um, as a and, also, and um, do you have any sort of backstory? Did you know the reasons for um, Dolly Singh's commissioning Richmond? Because he is uh, yeah. slightly, I mean, a very conventional choice, and maybe that's part of it. But I, he is such an austere, um, you know, to the point of dull. I think that that is that <laughs> artist, is part, but that's the part point. of it yeah. in, a, in a way. And um, Lady Logan, um, who uh, we keep going back to, she does... Um, talk about even three years before this, even before they're reunited, he's asking her who would be a good portraitist to paint his mother. Mm -hmm. um, so it may have come through these rather staid people that he's surrounded by, um, that he gets this suggestion, or just, mm -hmm. I think, because ev every year at the RA, he's showing, you know, the Duke of Buccleuch, the Bishop of uh, Bath, whoever, you know, that um, he, he's, he wants that pedigree. So you, do you 
into it ambivalence on Dalip Singh's part. Sort of I mean, wanting, he's, he's a profoundly ambivalent character. Well, so I, I know. Think, yeah, every, yeah, every, wanting to yeah. have a sort of true, whatever that is, representation of, of his mother, as particularly as a, you know, an Indian or member of the, you know, an Indian noble, but yet wanting something that would fit, you know, more yeah. into and, sort of conventional. And even, um, you know, with the portraits of his children who were raised as, as British aristocrats who wore uh, British clothing almost always in their painted portraits, they're um, dressed um, as Indian royalty mm-hmm. with um, Amritsar in the background, this place they were never allowed to visit. So I think there is a real tension there. Got a few more questions online, so I'm going to just sure. um, maybe Mark. Do you want to? Mark, do you have it? Enlighten us. Yeah. Hang on. Oh, hang on. We'll just give you the Thank microphone you. so you. people online yeah. can hear. Um, so this is the catalogue, 1865. Um, bearing in mind the academy at that point was in Somerset. Uh, sorry, in Trafalgar Square. It was in the middle room, the, thir- the the middle of three major display spaces. About 30 exhibits in, which suggests to me that it was on one of the end walls with the door in it, so not in one of the principal walls. But adjacent to it numerically was a work by Solomon Hart, uh, music, so a subject picture, and um, Joan of Arc by J.E. Millet. Oh, so uh, yeah, there yeah. we are. We could are, do a TV so, yeah. show, couldn't we, where we're doing research live? On- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Yeah. I mean, to me anyway, I yeah. would. <laughs> we do have Tune in. we do have graphic representations of these galleries from the 1850s, yeah. oh. so then- it's it's pretty easy to do a comparative analysis of that and get a vague position on the wall as to where this might have actually been. And are we at been. the National Gallery? This was the National Gallery yeah, building, so the, yeah. so the RA is at the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square at this time as well. Just, you know, yeah. just adding the layers of detail yeah. of, of, uh, of exhibition viewing. So, yeah, yeah. really interesting. Um, just a few of our online questions. I might kind of um, just group them together. I think we might have actually... Um, answered this a little bit through the conversation we just had this is a question from uh priya atwal saying apologies if i missed this do you have any insights into why julep singh commissioned uh richmond specifically for this portrait but i think that we might have kind of touched on that the question about whether there was any commentary about colonial material exploitation in terms of like mining and actually Mm. harvesting sourcing all that beautiful jewelry and the rhetoric around it um at the time that's from Alison Hockerson um and so I'm just grouping them because there's a lot yeah. and if we don't get to them I will pass these questions to Adam and, and he can, everybody's earned a drink yeah too, and so. he can uh, cogitate on them on in his own time um given the nature of the pejorative lens uh, with which Indians uh, or Indian subjects were viewed by British society at the time how would Dilip Singh's children feel displaying their grandmother in in their drawing rooms um yeah, well, um, pick your- <laughs> I'll, I'll pick um, Allison's question to start with about of actual mining. Um, I don't know of references to that in, in the art criticism, but um, I'm a big reader of Victorian fiction. And as many of you will know, Indian diamonds are a huge engine of plot in, in Victorian novels. If you think of the, the Moonstone, um, for example, by, by Wilkie Collins, or there are important Indian diamonds in, in Trollope as well. Um, so there, there's very much an awareness of where all of these stones come from and a fixation, of course, on the idea that they're cursed. That's why British kings don't wear the Koh-i-Noor because it's mm-hmm. cursed when men wear it, um, a superstition that's been adopted even by um, the British royal family. Um, so, so there is an awareness in, in that sense. Um, yeah, and I would just say um, the extended history of, of Dilip Singh's family, his, his children, is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I, I highly recommend, first of all, Priya Atwal's History of the Sikh Empire, which came up pretty recently. And then um, there's a wonderful biography of his daughter, Sophia, um, you might want to look for as well. Great, thank you. Uh, I, uh, thank you so much, um, Adam. That was a really wonderful lecture. Thank you. I just wanted to maybe pick up a little bit on the question of mining. Mm-hmm. And also, um, I was particularly interested in hearing your talk in regards to uh, the ledger that you had displayed, 
Because one of the things that I discovered, for example, um, in the research that I was conducting at the El Centre for British Art mm -hmm. was the um, extensive uh, amount of ledgers that I, I was able to locate both within that particular collection, but also more widely at Yale. And for me, that was really interesting because it, it spoke so loudly to the relevance of wealth and mining uh -huh. in a different way. So for example, one of the things that I was able to locate, in fact, was um, a drawing by James Forbes of the weight, the size, the dimensions of certain jewels or diamonds that he was able to find. And he attached to those tiny sketches the comments that were made, if I remember correctly, by his sort of group of you know friends that he might have shared that um, image with, for example, or the, the diamond with. Um, so I, you know, I, I just wanted to broaden out that question of of mining in relation yeah. to thinking about economies and how how really at that period in history. Um, you know, the British Raj having taken over from the East India Company was still very much involved in mining in a, in a broader sense, um, you know, wealth from uh, in different ways. So I don't want to lose sight in, in some senses of, of that. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. Thank you. And one thing that struck me when I was looking at the, the inventory of, of the restituted jewels is it, it's drawn up by the assistant to the governor general, but he seems to have a real expertise and an ability to appraise all these jewelries, to describe them, uh, jewels in, in technical terms. And I wonder if that's reflective, you know, of a broader period eye, if you want to use that term, that, that jewels are really important to these people and, and they're able to assess and appraise them. Um, and that that is a, a broadly shared form of, uh, visual acuity that that may be circulating, and of course, um, when Indian jewels are plundered by the British, they're almost always recut because they need to become faceted in order to be legible as jewels in a, in a British context. So unfaceted jewels, which you would have had in a, in a Mughal or Rajput context, look dull to British eyes. So even that. Um, uh, transformation of the jewel, which entails enormous loss of, of the size of the stone, um, has to take place as, as part of this seizure. Thank you. Great. Oh, let's just maybe squeeze one yes. more question in um, in the room, um, and then oh, we'll we'll th take a break. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, when I look at see the facture and the kind of sheer opulence of the of the way the uh, jewellery is done. I, I think of Rembrandt mm -hmm. and I wonder whether Richmond was um, framing her within Rembrandt's portraits of, or, or sorry, depictions of Jewish women from the mm -hmm. biblical heroines and, and such like. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, Richmond is someone who is very art historically informed and um, is certainly immersed in, in long traditions. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me. Um, I definitely get the sense, having seen a lot of his other work, that he's liberated in, in this work somehow. He's painting so much better than he, he normally paints. Mm -hmm. And it is painterly in that sense mm -hmm. that we do associate with Rembrandt, with the impasto. Um, and I haven't identified a specific source, but I think that's a really intriguing idea. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Well, there, had, there was an exhibition on Rembrandt and, and Jewish people. So, and I think maybe in the 19th century. It, it's interesting because of the link, the yeah. analogy to Jezebel that. Yeah. Oh. Great. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for giving us a paper that's obviously stimulated so many thoughts and questions. Um, if I didn't manage to ask the questions that came in online, I'll definitely pass those on to Adam so he can see um, that response from um, our audiences.
at home as well. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I think you've given us so much food for thought. We're all really excited about the project that is to come. And please join me in thanking Adam Eker for a wonderful presentation.